Please join me in the call to worship taken this morning from Psalm 82. God, you stand amidst all the flawed objects of praise. From among the false gods, you will judge. Bring justice to the downtrodden and orphaned, the poor and the hungry. Protect their rights. Rescue the needy and afflicted from the hands of the wrongful, lift them up by faith. I have said to humanity, you are made in the image of God, handiwork of the Most High, all of you. Rise up, God, judge the earth, for all nations belong to you. And now please join me in the Apostles' Creed found in your hymnals at 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 591, Rescue the Perishing. Please stand if it's comfortable for you to do so, and let's sing together.
loving Creator, we are grateful this morning to be in this nice warm place and to have the sun shining through our windows, with the stained glass reminding us of your glory. And God, as we enjoy each other's company, and as we enjoy the food and the fellowship that is to come after this service, we remember, O oh God, that there are those this morning who are grieving. And God, we lift them up to you. God, we remember this morning that there are those who are still seeking healing. And we lift them up to you. God, as we enjoy the warmth in the building, we remember that there are those who are without houses, whose home may be a tent, or a broken down car. And God, we are mindful that it is cold outside. And that tomorrow is forecast to bring freezing rain. And that the rest of the week, although it will be above freezing when it rains, will still be awfully cold. So God, we pray for all of the men and women and children who don't have a roof over their heads. God, we are grateful for stories of healing. We are grateful for stories of hope. We are grateful, O oh God, for the witness, the work, the teaching, the life and the death and the resurrection of your son Jesus, which is the greatest blessing to us. Loving creator, we seek to follow Jesus. Give us the courage, and the fortitude, Act on what we hear from his teaching. Help us, O oh God, to be loving and kind. Help us to care for those in need. Help us to care not only for each other here in this place, but for all those we encounter out there in the world. Oh God, as the body of Christ, we inherit his mission to bring good news to the poor and sight to the blind. So help us as we attempt to minister to our neighbors near and far, to be firm in our resolve to do as Jesus would have us do. Oh God, let us not forget how he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn this morning from the Little Black Book, number 2237 as a fire is meant for burning. If you're comfortable doing so, please stand and let's all sing.
experiment and throw it in the doxology. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter, starting in verse 25. I think you all will recognize this one. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will pay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In all the years I've been a pastor, I've always made sure to mark the worldwide celebration of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity with a sermon drawing on the materials published by the World Council of Churches and the Vatican. Ecumenism, the Christian movement to promote cooperation among all those who follow Jesus while celebrating the diversity of the expressions of our discipleship came to me from the accidents of where I lived and who I loved, but it has also become a foundational part of my theology, much studied and prayed about. You have heard, but I will reiterate, that I grew up Southern Baptist, of staunch Southern Baptist forebears. But my ecumenical journey began when we moved to England. And at age five, my formal education took place in Church of England schools until I was nearly nine, meaning that once a week, I attended chapel at school, utilizing a litany from the Book of Common Prayer, from which Methodist liturgy is also drawn. Upon our return to the U.S., my school friends and neighbors included Catholics, Lutherans, even the son of a minister in what was then known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Community of Christ. The spiritual mentors of my college days were a Jesuit priest and one of the first women ordained in the Episcopal Church in this country. And of course, 
I married a Catholic girl. But during my seminary years, as I deconstructed and reconstructed my faith so that I might be a truly thoughtful disciple of Jesus, I began to realize that the diversity of theologies and practices was not a sad mark of the fallen nature of Christians, but rather the heartfelt expression of the spiritual diversity breathed into us by the Holy Spirit. I began to work with ecumenical and cross-denominational organizations to explore and celebrate that diversity, to work towards unity, but not uniformity. As a layperson in Louisville, in Houston, and in Seattle, and as a clergyman here in Seattle and, and here in Missouri, I've worked to promote and encourage the ecumenical spirit because even the Samaritan is my neighbor. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Since I'm still learning your stories and the story of this church, I don't know whether or not you all have heard about the week of prayer for Christian unity. Anybody? Merlin, thank you. Kate, thank you. So some attribute the beginnings of the ecumenical movement to 1740, when a Pentecostal movement arose in Scotland, whose revivalist message included, included prayers for and with all churches. Now, more specifically, it has been 116 years since the inception of the program that became the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. In January of 1908, Father Paul Watson an Episcopal priest introduced what was first known as a prayer octave, eight days of prayer for Christian unity. In 1968, that program received endorsement from both the Vatican and the World Council of Churches and has since been observed by churches and parishes around the world. Each year, an ecumenical group from a specific country is chosen to produce a theme, select a scripture, and provide information on the ecumenical situation in their country and how the scriptural theme relates to them. This year's focus country is Burkina Faso, the ecumenical community of Chemin Neuf, French for the new path, has provided the materials which I've studied this week. Shimon Neuf describes themselves as a Catholic community with an ecumenical vocation. Organized in Lyon, France in 1973, they now have 2,400 members living, as the early church did, in communally supportive communities in 30 countries. In Burkina Faso, the community numbers 70 including, they write, mainly married couples, but including also a priest and a consecrated sister. Now, if you are like me, you are probably wondering where in the world is Burkina Faso? Anybody? Yeah. Some know, but I, I, I had to look it up. It's a smallish West African country roughly the size of Colorado, and similarly made up of mountainous country and high plateau. If you think of the great bulge of West Africa, right? Africa kind of sticks out on its west. And imagine that you have traveled roughly halfway from west to east through that bulge and then dropped south until you're about a quarter of the way from the southern coast that's Burkina Faso. Uh, the majority of the tribe, uh, excuse me, the majority tribe of the country are the Mossi. They had a thriving and relatively peaceful empire in the area from the 11th century until 1896 when the area was colonized by the French as French West Africa. Imaginative people, those French. As has been so often the case when Europeans carve up their former colonies without uh, the, the country of what was then called Upper Volta was established in 1958 without much regard for tribal boundaries 
or alliances or religious adherence. Upper Volta was renamed Burkina Faso, the land of honest men, in 1984. Now, the independent history of Burkina Faso has been troubled by political instability, extreme weather, and religious tensions. Located in the Sahel region, which includes the neighboring countries of Mali and Niger, Burkina Faso experiences some of the most radical climactic variation in the world, ranging from severe flooding to extreme drought. They are also subject to plagues of locusts and grasshoppers, which further damage their crops. And I imagine that you can imagine the consequences for a country in which 80% of the population is engaged in subsistence farming. That is, farming just enough to keep their families alive. The one major cash crop is cotton. Poverty, water scarcity, and food insecurity exacerbate those tribal and religious conflicts. Of the 21 million inhabitants, which comprise about 60 ethnicities, 64% are Muslim, 9% adhere to traditional African religions, and 26% are Christian, 20% Catholic, 6% Protestant. As the Burkinabes, as they call themselves, write of their situation, these three religious groups are present in every region of the country and in virtually every family. These divisions have played a role in one of the deep problems for Burkina Faso, interreligious bloodshed. As Shemin Neuf reports, after a major jihadist attack, was mounted from outside the country in 2016, the security situation in Burkina Faso and consequently its social cohesion deteriorated dramatically. The country has endured a proliferation of terrorist attacks, lawlessness, and human trafficking. This has left over 3,000 dead and almost 2 million internally displaced persons in the country. Thousands of schools, health centers, and town halls have been closed, and much of the socioeconomic and transport infrastructure has been destroyed. Christian churches have been expressly targeted by armed attacks. Priests, pastors, and catechists have been killed during worship, and the fate of others who were kidnapped remains unknown. At the time of writing, more than 22% of the national territory is out of the control of the state. Christians can no longer openly practice their faith in these areas. Because of terrorism, the majority of Christian churches in the north, east, and northwest of the country have been closed. There is no longer any public Christian worship in many of these areas. Where worship is still possible with police protection, usually in large cities, it has been necessary to shorten services owing to security concerns. The U.S. and several other governments have placed Burkina Faso on their no-travel lists. Nevertheless, the Burkinabes are an essentially hopeful people. An ancient Masi proverb says, no matter the nature or duration of the fight, the moment of reconciliation will come. It is with an eye to these tribal and religious conflicts that Shemen Neuf of Burkina Faso selected the gospel passage we heard this morning for their comments on Christian unity. Common use in our country of the word Samaritan to connote someone who does good deeds, often at their own risk, may obscure the impact of this story on the Burkinabes and indeed on Jesus' original audience. We are so used to hearing about good Samaritans that we may forget that the Samaritans were a despised religious minority in first century Palestine. 
They were descended from the remnant of the ten lost tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. These were the poor farmers and peasants left behind when the Assyrians carried away the cream of their nation. They had intermarried with those whom the Assyrians had brought in from other countries in their vast empire, knowing that both the displaced and the remnant would be easier to control if kept off balance by being thrown together. When their former neighbors in Judea returned from their own exile in Babylon, the Samaritans were astonished to find that the Judeans had edited Torah, which the Samaritans also held as God's law, and had added to it with histories, prophetic books, and other writings. This difference in religion and the Samaritans' racial mingling led to sometimes deadly enmity between Jews and Samaritans, which was still very much a part of the culture of Jesus' day. Jews considered Samaritans unclean, untrustworthy, and as people to be avoided. Now, the problem with excluding your physical neighbors from common humanity, as the Jews did with the Samaritans, is that exclusion becomes more and more a part of the communal mindset. Despite God's promises to Abraham that he and his descendants would be a blessing to the whole world, most Jews by the time of Jesus saw Gentiles only as enemies, not as potential friends or as potential worshipers of Yahweh. As the commentators from Shemen Nuf in Burkina Faso point out, the question of how the biblical obligation to love, of, excuse me, of how far the biblical obligation to love should reach was a disputed one among doctors of the law. Traditionally, this obligation was believed to extend to fellow Israelites and resident aliens. Later, with the impact of invasion by foreign powers, the commandment came to be understood as not applying to foreigners from occupying forces. In time, as Judaism itself fragmented, it was sometimes understood to apply only to one's particular faction. We can think of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and others. Or should we be thinking of the Methodists and the Baptists and the Episcopalians and the Catholics. As the Burkinabes point out, the question asked of Jesus by the lawyer, who is my neighbor, is therefore a provocative one. The parable told by Jesus would have been most unexpected by that expert in the Mosaic law, as well as by anyone else gathered to hear it, including Jesus' disciples. The frame of the story, of course, would have been familiar. The road from Jerusalem down to Jericho was lonely and dangerous. Most Jews would not take the direct route because it ran through the land of the unclean Samaritans. The road is steep, winding, and surrounded by cliffs, perfect for ambush. No one would have been surprised that the traveler was set upon. But a traveling priest surely would have had mercy on the victim. The traveling Levite, the equivalent of, um, of a church trustee or, or church musicians, surely would have been expected to aid someone in distress. But in Jesus' story, it is the despised Samaritan, enemy of the Jews for over five centuries, who stops in that hostile place, ministers to the injured man, carries him to safety, and pays for his continued care. With their use of this parable for the week of Christian unity, the Burkinabes are reminding the rest of us Christians that peace can never come when we harbor discriminatory views against any fellow human being, much less a fellow disciple of Jesus. A minority themselves, the Christians of Burkina Faso, are learning to cooperate among denominations simply to stay alive. They are reaching out to their countrymen of all religions in hopes of 
quelling the terrible divides that face them. They understand that the answer to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, is everyone. They see that they are called by God to love everyone they encounter so that they may hope to be loved in return. Now, we Christians of the United States are not in serious danger of jihad. Our infrastructure has not failed. We live in a land of plenty. But we have a lesson to learn from our Burkinaba, Burkinabe siblings. Who are those that we consider unclean? Who are those whose neighborhoods we will not travel through? Who do we despise for their religious or political views? Who are our Samaritans? However we answer those questions, we must remember that they too are our neighbors and that we are called to love them as we love ourselves. It can be so easy to fall into the trap of creating modern Samaritans. We may bear someone no conscious ill will. We may simply say that we're not comfortable around them for some reason. And so we don't get to know them. We don't visit their homes. We don't worship together. In the past seven months, I've heard frequently from my sisters and brothers in Jefferson County, that they just don't go to the city because they're uncomfortable there. I've heard from my neighbors in South St. Louis City that they don't go north of Del Mar Boulevard because they are uncomfortable there. Well, in three weeks, Connie and I will be among a pastor choir swap going from St. Andrew's to the Antioch Baptist Church in the traditional, traditional cultural core of black St. Louis in the north of the city. And at the same time, the pastor of Antioch, our former pastor, Reverend Dr. Delano Benson, will bring his choir here. Now, I've heard that there might be some St. Andrew's folks who are nervous about this field trip. And guess what? There are some of the folks in the Antioch Choir who are nervous about coming here, out to the country, out where there are no people who look like them. But if we are to learn to live with each other, if we are to learn to love each other, as God commands us to love our neighbors, then we better start getting to know each other. Connie and I can tell you there are an awful lot of good Samaritans at the Antioch Baptist Church. For the witness of the people of Shemen Nuf of Burkina Faso, for the witness of the Antioch Baptist Church, for the witness of St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, number 432, Jesu, Jesu. Please stand if it's comfortable for you to do so, and let's sing together.
my sisters and my brothers, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.